Okay, welcome everyone um, to the latest of our information sessions. So back, welcome back to Zoom. It's lovely to see you all online again today. Um, my name is Amanda Basu. I'm the General Manager of Government Relations and Affiliate Services for Netball Vic. So I will kick off and hand over to Mel Taylor, who you're all no doubt familiar with from these webinar series and from around the netball traps. But I would first like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we meet. Um, for me, that is the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, obviously, you are scattered across Victoria and possibly across a, a few borders. So that um, ranges on to many different ones wonderful parts of our country. Um, I'll also shout out to our president, Rochelle, who's on board today, and our board members, Carol, Kiralee, Nicole, and Kylie. Hopefully no one else snuck on since I wrote my little list there. Um, guessing that most of you are familiar with this series, but if you have a question along the way, pop it in the chat function. I'll be keeping an eye on that. If I don't answer your question immediately, it's because I know that Mel's gonna cover it in the upcoming or I'm saving it to group with a, a section, but pop it in there. And if you're thinking it, someone else probably is. So don't be shy at all to pop your questions in there. It creates a good conversation. Um, so that, that's really it from me, apart from a very big thank you to you all for continuing to persevere and um, navigate these waters that are COVID. Um, we understand that it's been a very, very tough period for everyone in the uncertainty that COVID presents and, and you've all navigated it. I know we've had um, roughly 25 uh, affiliates get back to play in between the two, two um, lockdowns and many more of you did a lot of hard work to be prepared for that. Um, eventuality of, of competition um, which didn't come to fruition and fingers crossed it will for our metro affiliates this time. We know that there's metro and regional on here today but everyone's effort um, really deserves a massive pat on the back for the work you've done and it's certainly not gone unnoticed from Netball Victoria and I have no doubt from your communities as well. So on that note over to you Mel to get into the guts of it all. Excellent thanks AB and yes absolutely well done everyone on uh, persisting, uh, what a time to build our resilience, hey, uh, and uh, see, see how we travel as humans uh, at this time. But um, the work that you guys have done, uh, connecting with your communities, staying engaged um, and uh, trying to get back to court um, has not been wasted. Um, in fact, it will hopefully save you a little bit of time this time around. Um, might have some people, I think, and Joe's one of those that did get back to competition early in July. And there's been a lot of lessons learned from that process. Um, and especially for the Metro guys, uh, your time is coming and it's um, just around the corner. But um, I think we're in, uh, in a slightly better position now in terms of what we know and what we don't know. Uh, and we're, we're playing a game with some rules around it now. So um, very familiar to netball and something that we're very comfortable with. Uh, so during this session, um, we'll go through the roadmap to reopening and we definitely do know that there are multiple steps. There are different steps for regional Victoria and uh, Metro Melbourne. So uh, we'll outline everything that we know about what that roadmap looks like. And again, some um, suggestions that uh, Metro Melbourne will move um, a further step over the weekend um, and potentially move outside of what was initially proposed. Um, we've got no further information on that, but we'll keep updated. Uh, we've updated our return to community netball guidelines um, and all of the other resources, including the checklist that were available um, in our last iteration. Um, we've also got some other resources which we've been able to develop over the last couple of months. Uh, so there's some detail around face coverings, um, in our last um, return, we learnt a fair bit about dealing with a suspected case and what that might look like uh, and community reaction, community response to that. Um, and then we've also got some other resources, some just some information um, that might be useful in the return. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about trials and selections and, and that sort of stuff, So, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, so effective... Um, 21st of September, or it actually come about on the 16th of September, Regional Victoria can return uh, to community netball. And we'll post some information on our social media pages um, later on today to, to formalise that. Um, and effective at this stage, a bit of an asterisk at that point, but for Metro Melbourne, uh, the 26th of October is earmarked for the return of community sport. 
Um, just a quick snapshot of um, one of our resources, and you'll notice a few, um, there's a lot of detail <laughs> hidden in there. So you'll notice the step um, that we're up to, so the third step, uh, who it applies to, so a regional Victoria or a Metro Melbourne, and the date that it becomes effective. Just make sure you're looking at the right resources um, so we don't want Metro to pay attention to regional Victoria and think that um, they're right to get out and play and say Netball Victoria told us. Uh, so just make sure you're looking at the detail. Um, the roadmap to reopening for Metro, um, as I said, from Sunday, it looks like uh, our daily case rate will definitely fall between that 30 and 50 threshold, um, which is fantastic. And uh, it's been hard work um, and there's lots of angst out there, but um, it seems to be working. So well done to everyone that's at home in Metro Melbourne. Um, it doesn't indicate the return of community sport, though. We do have to wait to the third step, which is proposed at this stage for the 26th of October with the threshold of uh, less than five new cases over a 14 day period. And that will then activate outdoor uh, contact and non-contact sport for those 18 years and younger and non-contact sport for adults. Uh, the last step, um, we're getting to a, a much broader um, adult contact and indoor facilities to open for Metro. For regional Victoria, as of the 16th of September, community sport is allowed outdoors for those 18 years and younger um, training only or non-contact sport for 18, uh, for adults. And the last step, we, we sort of come back as one collective state. Uh, so regional Victoria waiting until the 23rd of November. Um, if the state reaches no uh, new cases over a 14 day period, uh, and then we can return to contact sport for all ages and indoor facilities will open. Uh, there are asterisks against all of those dates. Um, so again, if we, if we move forward quicker uh, and if our case numbers are looking better, then it, it's possible that the government will uh, change some of the restriction levels or change some of the dates, but we, we'll always stay tuned in to to the Premier's press conferences um, and up to date on any announcements relating to community sport. Uh, so again, just to go over those age groupings, uh, and this is for regional Victoria as of uh, the 21st of September, but uh, contact and non-contact community sport can return for those 18 years and younger. Uh, participants um, that are required for the game, so if you've got a team of 10 and a team of 11, then you can have 21 participants on the court, plus essential support personnel. Uh, essential support personnel in terms of netball, coaches, team managers, umpires. Uh, again, please don't try and come up with creative new roles uh, that you can get adults included or involved in. Um, just essential support personnel. Um, for adults um, or those over the age of 18, uh, it's non-contact training and definitely no competition at this stage. Uh, group limits apply and we're recommending uh, 20 per court, a maximum of 20 per court. And any training activity needs to be modified to allow physical distancing to occur. So really when you're 1.5 metres apart and you're moving around a court, 20 people on a court is actually quite a lot. Uh, so a bit of a common sense approach with that. Uh, there are definitely no spectators and that's quite clear. However, uh, people that are required to supervise our children are allowed or people required to support those with additional needs are permitted. Uh, if we do need uh, people to supervise children, then we're recommending that you guys recommend a maximum of one parent or guardian per child uh, and really only if necessary. Um, all parents and guardians need to abide by gathering restrictions and that's uh, not gathering in groups of 10 or more. Uh, and last time around we had quite a number of questions around siblings. So we know that um, you can't leave kids in the car or at home by themselves uh, and sometimes it is unavoidable. Um, we also know that sometimes there is an alternative. So really it's just communication with parents about um, is there an, another option? 
and if not, just make sure that the kids are, are not um, not going crazy around a venue. We also know kids are not going to stand still for the duration of a netball game uh, close to their parents uh, while big sister is playing. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Um, so things like, you know, there's a playground next to nearly every netball court in Victoria. Um, they need to make sure that uh, they're supervised um, and still abiding by the gathering restrictions that um, apply to playgrounds and stuff like that. Uh, for venues, again, um, outdoor venues only at this stage. Indoor venues are to remain closed. And uh, again, that's until uh, the 23rd of November. Um, for everyone, uh, if they haven't initiated it already, um, reach out to local council um, or your venue manager to confirm access um, and then to negotiate any requirements. Some councils are requesting a COVID safety plan um, and some of you guys may have already completed that, which is great. Um, if you haven't and you need some support to do that, uh, Nepal Victoria has the return to play plan, which uh, will be available on our website that you can pretty much cut and paste. Uh, and encourage you to use the resource that resources that we already have already developed, cut and paste from them and use them as a really uh, solid starting point to develop your COVID safety plan uh, and, and use it, yeah, really use that as a reference. Um, you may also know that uh, local council elections are coming up and council are in caretaker mode. Um, we're, we're being told that that doesn't affect any operational um, stuff, so you shouldn't have a, an issue about contacting a council officer and, and talking about the operations of a venue at this point. Uh, for tenant clubs, um, or for those that don't um, have access to their own venue but hire it off someone else, uh, please make contact with the person that you hire it from um, and confirm the booking and hire arrangements, especially where there's crossover in groups. So uh, we had a few examples last time about um, a lack of communication between multiple groups um, where you showed up to a venue and they were too close or that, you know, the, the numbers outweighed what was actually possible. So just make sure that you're um, going through the right systems uh, and making sure you're ticking all of the boxes there. Uh, school venues, uh, this was a, a bit of a tricky question um, or, and it has been since March really, um, and access to school venues. Uh, we know the Department of Education uh, have a fairly standardised response that school venues can be available to community groups uh, as long as there's no crossover between school time and the, the community sport time. So allow half an hour between the end of school and the start of the community sport. Uh, we also know, uh, and AB, you might want to jump in here, but uh, we also know that some schools um, are, are going, are making their own decisions about access to schools, and that might relate to cleaning or or just um, logistics about getting into the venue. Yeah, and and obviously, um, being school holidays, it may be difficult to have a conversation with your school right now. But the the principal and your school council do have um, some decision making authority within within that situation. So the sooner you can make contact and understand what their requirements are probably is the best um, best way to approach that. Uh, and plan ahead. And really when you're planning ahead, um, allow yourself enough time uh, and don't feel rushed or under too much pressure. And we know that uh, we're nearing the end of the year and we've only got, you know, 10 weeks to get a competition up and what do we do and how long should it go for and what's viable, what's actually going to be meaningful. We know that you guys are asking all of those questions now, um, but don't rush it. Uh, make sure you really give yourself time. We've updated the checklist just to put, um, and they're really just thinking points uh, and discussion points. Sit down with the members of your committee or someone else that can help uh, and support you through it. Um, run through it with your clubs just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, uh, but really use the templates that we've got available just to prompt your thinking um, and make sure that uh, you're going through all of the right steps. Uh, and continue to communicate with your clubs, with your teams, with your members. Um, use signage so that people know what to expect uh, and use social media to, if you can uh, to communicate with your members. Um, in July, uh, we found that 
generally, um, the netball community uh, and for those 25 associations that did return, um, most people have seen the return to community sport and in particular netball as a real privilege. Uh, and they were thankful and they were grateful uh, and they just loved getting back out on court. Um, smiles on kids' faces, parents being able to sit down and have a coffee in close proximity to another human that wasn't a member of their family uh, was taken really well. Um, and so people were really compliant but it required a lot of uh, communication from the club or the association. So be really clear with your members about what you're asking of them. Uh, be really clear about the guidelines. And if they've got the information and they know how important it is, um, they were super compliant and very, you know, we had people putting up their hand uh, to help out, to do a little thing, um, to clean. Uh, it, it was actually really lovely. And I think the, the nicety of netball or the, the community spirit of netball really shone out at that time. Uh, but also, alternatively, people don't know what they don't know. So if you don't tell them and then you try and pull them up on a, on a, a point, uh, then it's easy to say, sorry, I didn't know. Uh, so tell them, you know, my, my phrase about tell them, tell them again and then tell them what you told them, roll it out. Uh, for other facilities, so not playing facilities, but there are limited access to indoor facilities or it is permitted, uh, toilets, change areas and administration um, areas are all uh, permitted. Uh, I just handed it over to you guys. Toilets are, are, are probably a non-negotiable. Um, if you've got access to public toilets, then you may not need to open a pavilion or if you've got indoor and outdoor spaces, um, then consider how you, you do manage that access. Um, we had a number of associations or venues last time just tell their, their community, please sh show up ready to play and not have access to change areas. It's just another thing that people have to clean or to manage or to monitor. So if you can, you don't need to open change areas. Uh, and then how you administer your competition or your junior competition, um, what spaces you have available and whether you do have an administration area that you want to enter, you can. Uh, just think about the need. Canteens and cafes can open, um, but for any any food service, um, there needs to you need to follow the industry restart guidelines for hospitality. Uh, so there's a link on our website, but um, you'll need to know or read and understand all of those additional requirements. Um, continue to manage um, access entry and exit points, uh, display signage, let people know where you want them to go and, and how they get there. Um, we know some venues, that's really easy. There's an in and an out, and that's that's quite easy to manage or to set up. Uh, for outdoor courts, there might be a gate leading in and a gate leading out. For others, there are no fences and no gates. So we had a few questions about, we don't actually have an entry and exit point. How do we manage that? Uh, sometimes that's okay. Uh, you know, if you've got uh, 50 people entering from 50 different entry points, then uh, there's no there's no issue about that um, congestion or people coming together. Um, something simple, or you know, last time around we had a few a few clubs um, allocate parking areas. So if you're playing on court one, two, and three, four, park in this area. If you're park if you're playing on courts five, six, seven, and eight, park in this area just has that natural flow um, where you don't have to sign or mark uh, a particular area but uh, makes it a little bit easier. So that's venue specific. You guys will think about what's going to work for your particular venue. Uh, any areas where people do start to congregate or come together, then think about how you're going to manage that. And signage, crosses on the ground. Again, people are quite compliant if they're given the information. Um, seating areas, some people totally block seating areas off and ask people to stand, um, show them where they can stand. But yeah, the more information that you can give and the more direction you can give to people, uh, the more they'll follow. Uh, and this time around, we are um, required to keep a record of attendance as well. Uh, and I really, we've got a, a template, it's a paper template, a PDF that you can type into. Um, but I actually encourage you guys to use technology and we had a few associations that um, started using QR codes. Uh, so as someone walks in the door, 
all they have to do is scan it with, uh, scan the code with their phone, uh, type in their name, phone number, uh, it's date marked, time stamped, uh, and you get a, an Excel spreadsheet print out of it as well. So uh, use the technology that's available to you. Um, if you yourself are not comfortable um, or you don't have a member of your committee, there will be someone in your association that knows this stuff um, and it's super simple to set up and it's super simple to manage. It will make your lives easier as well. So uh, where you can make use of the technology that's available, um, we'll have some, some information uh, for associations about how to do that. Uh, also, when you're recording attendance, don't duplicate. Uh, save yourself some administration time. So if you're collecting players' names through a score sheet, don't also ask them to complete a QR code or to fill out another form. Likewise with umpires, if you've got a record of umpires, the time that they, or the games that they're umpiring, uh, if they sign in or sign out, whatever works, um, don't duplicate. Same with coaches, any of those essential support personnel. Um, we will be required to keep uh, attendance or track attendance of parents and guardians as well. And how, how you guys manage that, um, whether it is through a QR code, uh, maybe you can pass that on to clubs to, or teams to try and collect the information and pass it on to you. Um, it's really about distributing our roles and responsibilities and not placing anything or any responsibility on one particular person. We do know, and it's come out in the last couple of weeks, how important that recording of attendance is. Uh, it helps with contact tracing. So if there is a positive case in an area, then we need to be able to contact those people really quite quickly. Uh, so make sure you pay attention to this part. Yep. And we've just had a question, Mel, which is good because you need a breather. And I was just going to ask people to remind people to submit their questions, but um, just in those instances where we have venues that don't have um, fences or way to, ways to capture people, you still need to make your best endeavours to catch um, the attendance of, spec well, not spectators, but the required personnel or the supervising parents. Um, obviously, that can be difficult, but you want to make your best endeavour. But if someone's being difficult, that is not your, your job to tackle them to the ground and collect their details. Um, it's certainly your best efforts to capture that um, and hopefully you can capture that in advance as, as Mel's just said if you can get your club to be the, the team to be responsible your team manager can potentially know that um, Amanda's bringing her daughter Layla today um, and and have that information in advance of me even turning up at the venue um, so then it might just be a late minute change for them if something happens and my husband comes instead of me it's just a quick update to that team's records before they feed it up so best endeavors um absolutely um is will it be perfect no because there'll probably be someone always who who meddles it up without even meaning to but yeah just it's as best you can and as i said any questions keep popping them in um because mel needs a breather every now and then between speaking uh and we we Love the questions. Um, love to be challenged. Um, let's see what we let's see what knowledge is in the back of our heads here. Um, and I'll just answer this last question while you're just setting up the next slide. So, the um, the twenty four November or twenty three November date at the moment um, that that's for regional and metro. Um, we'll update if there's a change to that. And when we say going back to normal, it's not necessarily back to normal. It'll be to our COVID normal. Um, but until further advice, that is a combined Victorian statewide date. So there's potential it could change, but just um, we will update you if that does change. Uh, terrific. So um, just in terms of equipment use for um, any activity, uh, Equipment use for all ages, whether they're playing in a competition, juniors playing competition or adults training, uh, minimise the use of shared equipment um, and really a common sense approach here. So we know that um, if you're playing netball, then you're all going to touch the same ball. Um, but make sure it's cleaned and sanitised between each use. Uh, where you can uh, wipe down post padding, uh, if you're um, accessing team benches, then make sure they're wiped down uh, between each game or between each use. Um, 
Uh, bibs, make sure that they're only used once, um, especially bibs that come off um, over the face. Um, but yeah, a, a real common sense approach and take that one use approach um, for any of the, the equipment that's used. Uh, as well as on court equipment, this, that also applies to anything that is being used by admin staff and volunteers. So something like a, a clipboard or um, just make sure that that's all wiped down. Now, there's some really, you know, people got uh, really good at uh, shopping around for alternatives or, you know, uh, the equipment that is used. So whether it's a spray and wipe with a chucks or whether it's a, a antibacterial wipe, um, whatever's easiest and convenient um, and can be managed and having gloves available for everyone to use. Uh, now, face coverings, we had quite a few questions about this at last night's session. Uh, face coverings um, is a, a government policy and it's um, mandated that everyone should wear a face covering as soon as they step out of their door. Um, there are fines in place if you, if you don't. Uh, we also know that there's uh, a number of people in our community that um, don't like them. Uh, no one likes them, but uh, we have to wear them. Uh, we've got a, a just a one pay or a, a resource uh, that covers the requirements for each of the roles and age groups. And again, it's a bit of a common sense approach, but uh, players obviously don't need to wear a mask while they're playing. Uh, umpires don't need to wear a mask by, while they're officiating. We're, we're recommending that coaches do wear a mask, but again, that's a, a bit of a per person choice. Um, some, some people find it quite difficult to communicate with their players if they're wearing a face covering. Um, so it's a recommendation, but not a requirement during the game. Uh, then passive roles like a scorer, um, they are required to wear a face mask while they're scoring. Uh, everyone coming into the venue and leaving the venue needs to wear a face covering. Administration, volunteers, uh, staff all need to wear face coverings. And your players on the bench are considered to be actively participating. So while they're sitting on the bench, they don't have to wear their mask. But once the game is over or on the way to the game, as Mel's just said, they would need their mask then if they're 12 and over. Yeah. And then just practicalities, like if you wear a face mask when you're attending, then you've got to play, what do you do with it? Suggest you probably don't hang it on the hook at, on the team bench, but, you know, shove it in a bag and don't shove it down your top or up your briefs. Um, yeah. I'm sure people will come up with creative ways that they can uh, store their face coverings. But, um, uh, again, a bit of a practical approach. Uh, in the guidelines, there's also some information about age groups. So anyone 12 and under, I think it is, uh, it's a choice. They can. They don't have to. Anyone over the age of 12 needs to, uh, and kids between naught and three, I'm going to say, read the, refer to the guidelines, uh, shouldn't ever wear a mask. Yep. Mel, just to clarify there, it's 12 and over, because I've got a 12-year-old who got a mask for his birthday. Um, wow. <laughs> delight. Um, and just circling back on the just um, a question just about the coaches. So it has a recommendation that a coach wears a mask, but I did say to Mel, I'm having trouble ordering my meat at the butchers um, because I'm a quietly spoken person. So if I was coaching a group of kids, I feel I might have trouble communicating with them. So I might need to take the mask off just to get a message across. But as much as possible, I'd keep that mask on. Uh, excellent. Uh, so, um, again, uh, Nepal Victoria, we're not um, asking associations or clubs to appoint a COVID safety officer. We do understand that some local governments or some venues are requesting to have a COVID safety no officer nominated. So, um, if, if that's a request from local government or your venue, then you will need to do it. Um, from Nepal Vic, we really um, promote a shared approach and don't want to place um, the burden of or the sole responsibility of this enormous, enormous task on one person, on the shoulders of one person. Uh, so really make sure you're talking uh, to all of your committee, 
uh, call out for volunteers. Um, as I said, last time around, people were happy if it was one small thing that they could contribute and that allowed their kids to play netball, then they were more than happy to put up their hand. Uh, and make sure that those roles and responsibilities are clearly marked. Again, we don't, a shared approach can often um, come with the, oh, I thought someone else was doing it. I thought Amanda was going to do that. Um, so make sure that the roles and responsibilities are really clearly defined uh, and make sure that th those roles and responsibilities are ticked off somehow. But uh, take a shared approach uh, and share, share the load. Uh, make sure that everyone's reading and understanding the updated guidelines and please, uh, th those resources are there for you guys to use. Um, in particular, the, the guidelines for Netball Victoria members, please share that with your crew, with your players, coaches, umpires, administrators, volunteers, uh, parents and guardians. Make sure that they know, as we said earlier, uh, the more people know, the more compliant or the more they'll follow the guidelines. Uh, and continue to communicate. So don't just hand it to them, but uh, put up messages on your social media pages, stick notices around uh, the venue if you can. Uh, and I think we've worked it out now, but um, there's a, now a really clear understanding about the difference between responsibility and liability. Uh, and uh, just to reinforce the fact that for every affiliated association club and uh, every current Nepal Victoria member, uh, you guys are covered under our insurance policy. Um, AV alluded to this a little bit before, but in terms of managing venues and managing people, uh, again, we take a shared approach and everyone has a role to play. Uh, there are some key markers where um, you might look out the window of your venue, or hopefully you're not indoors too much, but uh, look out at your venue uh, and see people that you don't quite think are meeting the physical distancing uh, requirements or there might be 12 people standing in close proximity rather than eight uh, or someone that's not wearing a face covering. Again, they're all messages that uh, we expect you guys to promote and to sell uh, uh, and to push. Um, but when it comes to enforcement, um, as AB said, we don't expect you to tackle people to the ground. Uh, and, and really enforce it. Um, there's there's a, a line in the sand, I guess. Uh, the more information uh, and the more that we can communicate our guidelines to our members, um, but th there, there may be people in our community that just defy us uh, and government policy and, and won't adhere to it. Uh, all we can do is um, gently encourage or strongly encourage at some point, um, but understand that it's not your role nor your responsibility to, to enforce. Um, some of the, the bigger outdoor venues, uh, before you get, you know, if you have a, an open training or a, a, your first day of competition, uh, then you might want to contact the local police officers and say, do you just want to do a drive-by? People see uh, uniform, uh, they might prick up their ears a little bit um, and pay attention. Uh, and the other I mentioned earlier, we do have a dealing with a suspected case resource that we've um, developed and uh, towards, uh, for our 25-ish 25 -ish, 25 -ish associations that uh, got up and running uh, back in July, um, there were a number of suspected cases that we heard of uh, and some of those were legitimate. You know, we had schools closing down, um, community areas or, you know, some of the small community towns, there were lots of rumours, have you heard or did you know or we think. Um, really pay attention to not to actual real information. Don't listen to, although our netball grapevine is strong uh, and active, uh, but really pay attention to the, de to the detail and the accurate information. Uh, schools were putting out information in terms of school closures or will be sharp for a deep clean uh, and reopening. Follow their information and their advice. Uh, and um, anything that comes through the Department of Health and Human Services, make sure you're following their, their advice as well. Um, it, it, uh, hopefully we don't get back to that point, but it, it was quite um, tense uh, and, and really quite exhausting trying to keep up with with the caseload that was that was coming out last time, uh, which ended up in obviously our shutdown, but 
Uh, there's a, a, some frequently asked questions or some questions to guide you through your decision making process. Please consult with your committee. Don't feel like you have to make a decision. Um, don't have a knee jerk reaction. Really consider um, your, the options that are available and please make contact with us and, and talk through the process. We're more than happy to, to guide you through that. We won't make the decision for you. That's ultimately your decision to make, but um, more than happy to talk you through a process. And I'll just jump in and um, just a question here, Mel, around whether venues will let admin people be inside while everyone else stays outside. So there will be, that's a conversation as well to have you with your venue manager because it might be something that they'll have a ruling on. But the other part of that, I guess, is if you've got a competition office inside, think about limiting who needs to be in it. So if your score sheets can be picked up from a table outside your building that will save you a lot of traffic flow and it may just be one person sitting in a comp office entering results etc as opposed to um that's the continuous flow and everyone leaning on the counter and having a chat because they haven't seen you for a while so um just another thing to be conscious of to save you with cleaning and traffic yes and very venue specific yeah Uh, our health and hygiene messages are constant uh, and all the same. Uh, they're on all of our resources. Um, and again, messages to our community. Uh, don't attend if you've had co close contact with a known or suspected case. Uh, follow instructions from Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, anyone experiencing symptoms should get tested. Uh, and if you feel unwell, please don't attend. Uh, so thinking ahead, just some other things to consider. And again, I think questions that are rolling around uh, all of your heads at the minute um, or being discussed around virtual committee tables. Um, but uh, supporting participation is clearly the, the strongest message that um, we want to promote. And it's the strongest message that we're hearing from you guys as well, is that we just want to see kids playing. Uh, we just want to provide an opportunity to get back out on court. Um, and our hashtag play for the love, we totally support that. Uh, that might mean that um, competition models are a little bit different, uh, that we're running short six week seasons or uh, whatever is going to work for your association that facilitates participation, uh, then we encourage that. Uh, the 18 years and under ruling, um, a few of our uh, associations that got up and running earlier in the year, they changed their, their grading um, or age groups. So they run an, under a, a, an 18 and under competition instead of, the, instead of a 17 and under competition. Uh, that just allowed those 18 year olds somewhere to play, um, but also helped some of those struggling teams to find an extra player or two that they might've needed at that time. Uh, so that was a, a really, sensible, um, smart uh, and creative way of um, facilitating or supporting participation. Um, we also know that some people might be not comfortable in coming back just yet um, or a bit unsure or uncertain. Uh, please don't force or um, unknowingly force someone to come along. So when we talk about trials and team selections, uh, if we're looking at next year, there's someone that's slightly uncomfortable think that they actually need to come along because if they don't come now uh, then they won't be able to play next year. We don't want to limit anyone's opportunity uh, now or into the future. Um, we want to have opening, uh, open and welcoming arms um, for everyone to be able to play. In terms of trials and competition, uh, team selection, sorry, um, we've had a number of questions from associations that are usually trialling or thinking about trialling early uh, term four for their uh, seasons um, or rep teams or uh, to enter into Waverley or Parkville early next year. Uh, and we know that the timing probably doesn't allow for trials to be pushed into early next year. Um, we've uh, put together a bit of a guiding principles document, which will be uploaded onto the website and we'll send it out to all of our associations. Uh, but just in terms of things to think about, so if you usually run trials on the second week of October, we're suggesting that you might need to reconsider that timeline and maybe adjust the way that you would normally trial. Some of our community haven't played for six to eight months. 
Uh, so running a trial and expecting them to show up on day one and perform at their peak um, is just unrealistic at this stage. Uh, supporting participation, we think most people will re-engage with netball, especially juniors, um, for that social interaction. And that's really what we want to facilitate. So try not to put too much pressure on people performing or making a particular grade. Uh, they will carry that stuff themselves, but um, the way that you communicate with them and set that up uh, will be really important. I'm not saying not to run trials, uh, just think about the way that you can roll those out uh, and how you you gradually introduce um, competition or gradually introduce um, elements of competition into your training sessions. Uh, again, don't expect people to run out a full 60 minute game um, uh, at their peak, because uh, it, it, it's just too much um, at the minute. Uh, as well as the physicality, is, uh, we really need to think about people's mental health or mental fitness. Um, so we, we haven't been exposed to a lot of people or a lot of conversation um, or a lot of stimulus um, for a very long time. So netball, there's noises and sounds and colours and people and uh, that that potentially can be quite overwhelming for people. So really let people come in at their own time. Um, some people will come back in and it will be like they never left. Um, others uh, will need a little bit of time to, to get there. Um, Mel just had a really good question and we didn't get this one last night, but about um, are we able to run Net Set Go? And the answer is most certainly yes. Um, obviously um, the kids, yeah, at that age group are keen to come back too. So again, it's just thinking about how you overlay that as an activity and make sure that you're, um, you've you got your, your groups moving in and out at, um, at different times. And it might not be having a massive group of net set go, but a number of smaller ones, um, depending on what format you normally would run net set go in. But absolutely, yep, anyone who can get back on court should get back on court if it's if you're able to. Yes, and along those lines, uh, so any netball program, we've had, um, especially at this time of year, we have quite a few um, associations run a Rock Up Twilight um, competition. Um, Rock Up is, again, can, can go ahead and might provide a little bit of flexibility to in the way that um, people engage uh, with a competition or a short season. Uh, 2021 competition planning, um, again, Horses for Courses, you guys will, will know uh, what your competitions usually look like and what they might need to look like going into the future. Um, our roadmap indicates that by the end of the year, we will be in a COVID normal um, environment, but what that means, none of us actually know. Um, so uh, I think flexibility is the main point. Don't lock yourself into um, a 30 week season. Uh, it's just too long. Um, but think about how you can structure and try and try some of the, the, the initiatives. Um, likewise, you know, netball, we're pretty hard and fast if you don't have your team entry in by 4.59 on the Friday afternoon, then you can't enter. Um, with people easing back into life, um, we might need to be a little bit flexible about uh, competition structures and team entries, uh, allowing people to you know, trials and team selections, if someone doesn't attend a trial, can they come in at, at a later point? Um, just a, a little a mindfulness around flexibility, I think, is what we need. Uh, the age groupings. So I mentioned that 18 and under example before. Um, and again, associations will make their own determination nationally or statewide. We're, we're not um, expecting to any changes to our age grouping. So we'll stick with our 13, 15, 17 age group, especially for things like a social chance. If we tweaked at one end, you know, we've got top age under 17s that have missed out on pretty much a year of netball and that's heartbreaking for them. But if we tweak it this year, then our bottom ages will miss out next year as well. So um, you can't change one part of the system without the whole system changing. So. Netball Victoria and Netball Australia are not changing and have no recommendation to change out the age groups, but it might be a conversation that you guys have at, at club or association level. And just in terms of our associate champs and trials and team selections, um, 
we're looking at pushing associate. We, we've missed association chance. It's one of my favourite events of, on the cal netball calendar. Um, and yeah, we want to make sure that that um, is able to run next year. Um, and but we'll probably move it back just a couple of weeks or a month. So predominantly running June next year rather than over the May and June period. Uh, Nepal Vic membership. So um, I might leave that for AB to talk about when we get to the reimbursement stuff. Um, and again, where you can uh, communicate, use technology, um, implement QR codes. Um, having you know the My Netball app and fixtures online is really helpful, so you don't have to to constantly push things out. Um, I'll just jump in there with a couple of questions there, Mel. You actually answered one without us throwing there. It's a good ESP, but um, just in regards to clearing courts between time slots, um, there's not a, a regulation or a rule around that because each venue is different. So it's about putting it, your venue plan in. The bigger venues probably you do need more time between games. And again, the fences and all those other variables play into that. But we would probably advise you to, to add a, perhaps an extra five minutes, um, depending on the volume of your venue, just to give yourself time to do the things that you'll need to do between a game. So the, the cleaning, but also to limit your crossover of um, people and make it easier for yourself. Um, and just got another question here about Metro Melbourne, if what we're seeing in terms of trends of um, what Metro associations are, are planning to do with their junior competitions, whether they're going to get up short seasons. So um, I think Kylie from Mina has, uh, from our board and also from Mina has dropped off, but she was telling me the other day, they're looking at a five week, um, very social season um, for that period. Um, I know that there's some variables, but um, interested if anyone from Metro has got something concrete that they're planning towards, feel free to pop it in the chat as well and we can, um, connect people as well. We've, we've certainly um, last night had Golden City on board who offered um, their advice having got back between the two sessions they offered their advice to others and I know that um, Pam in, in that region for Netball Vic had connected um, Golden City with others in help, helping them formulate the return to play but um, most certainly I'm sure there's Metro affiliates willing to talk to each other as well to offer support and advice because we are very good competitors once we cross the line, but um, very good colleagues off the court as well. Yeah, back to you, Mel. Up to date with questions for there. Well, I'll let you keep going then, AB, and you can okay. touch on the reimbursement policy. Okay, I'll keep talking then. Um, so the Goodwill reimbursement, that was the last time we were online with you all to, to discuss that um, policy. So it does have 63 associations there, but we've just jumped up to 64 this week in terms of um, affiliates that have pledged to um, encourage their members to support leaving their money with Netball Vic. Um, I'm happy to say that 20% of people who are applying have been pledging their membership. So that is certainly um, very pleasing to see that we'll we, we're confident we'll be able to reinvest back into Netball and help support you to, to um, re-engage as we return to our COVID normal. So that process, as you're, as you're aware, is still open until the 31st of October. Um, that was to be to close on 31st of October, thinking that everyone would be very clear about the end of netball plans. Um, and unfortunately, there's probably a, still going to be a little bit of uncertainty around the 31st of October, um, given the roadmap, but we'll all cross our fingers and hope that, um, that we get a bit more clarity in the next week or so. But... Um, most certainly we've gone through a process, we're, we're well in the process and we're keeping up to date with that. So people are being reimbursed quite quickly in the process, um, but we are rolling people over as well, transferring people into next year. So we had some questions last year about, um, last night, sorry, not last year. It is, geez, the year's taking a long time, but not that long. Um, but we had some questions last night about uh, whether we could report to you how many of your members are electing to, to do that. Um, obviously, we've provided you in, with information about how you can run a deregistration report to see which of your members are no longer financial, have elected for the full refund. Anyone who's elected to transfer has also been deregistered as we go. Um, everyone will need a, a membership if you are coming back to play. So anyone who's elected a 50% reimbursement remains covered. Um, anyone else can purchase at the 50% rate 
So just double checking as well that all of your forms, et cetera, have been adjusted to the 50% discount pricing for Netball Vic membership. Um, and we will also be, provide you with a little bit of reporting around how many of your members are electing to transfer into next year. So that might give you a little bit of a guide into your planning as well, that you've already got some financial members for next year um, starting to come into the system. So I think if I've captured everything there, Mel, I think. Yep, perfect, thanks. Um, and uh, I think uh, the, the July window gave us a really good insight into how people are feeling as well. We didn't get that um, opportunity or we didn't get to see uh, the, the feeling or the sense from adults because adults didn't quite get back to competition training, although there are a lot of teams that started um, training. But in terms of junior participation, um, there was a real keenness and an interest for juniors to get back to sport. And we hope to see that into next year. You know, the, there's a lot of variables and a lot of uncertainty about our membership numbers and what your membership numbers will look like and the appetite for people to want to wanna re engage. Um, we'll have to wait and see a, a fair bit, but um, we're expecting junior participation uh, to come back quite strongly. Um, kids have had um, such a big hit this year and they've missed out on a lot. Um, you know, that social interaction, that schooling, that physicality of, of community sport and team sport. Um, so we think that there's going to be a real desire for juniors to get back. Uh, we might need to encourage our adults a little bit more. There's, you know, finances, uh, the fact that they've been at home for quite some time and that might be comfortable for people. Um, but also know that there are some really strong draws back to team sport uh, and to community sport that we can we can help promote. Um, so yeah, the, the, the reimbursement stuff has given us a, a, an insight into um, what people are thinking uh, and then the number of rollovers or people that are requesting rollovers, but are expecting Netball to bounce back strongly. Yep. And I'll just jump in on the back of that, Mel, just a couple of questions about reimbursements. So yes, anyone that's rolled over or transferred their current membership into next year, they are no longer financial um, with this calendar year. So they would need to purchase a membership for this year at the 50% rate. Um, and just a query whether we'd had any many requests denied for reimbursements. We've had a few people not fill in the form correctly, um, whether that's um, an accidental. We did have one parent who was sure that their child hadn't played this year because it was back in term one when she participated. So we've had a few people that um, have made genuine mistakes or, or, or even sought reimbursements for kids they thought they'd registered who had, they hadn't quite got around to it um, because we've all got COVID brain as well as parent brain. Um, so there are some people that um, certainly haven't got what they initially applied for, but we're working through that process. Um, and generally we've had good feedback from our reimbursement um, policy and it's been really well received. And, and I think as well, that goes to the support of our affiliates in, in sharing that messaging to the community. So thank you for that. Um, just got... I might let you go back in, Mel, and then I'll capture off these last questions that are coming through at the end of the next slide. I can't actually remember what's next. So, uh, so um, just reinforcing that play for the love message and uh, let's see what we can get done. Uh, and, you know, um, appreciate that there's a lot of detail and a lot of um, working through the that each association needs to do and that timing, uh, reliance on volunteers. So, please um, make your own decisions. Think about other ways of doing things. If you, if you decide that you can't run your standard competition, um, then uh, are there different ways that you can start to engage with your members? Uh, just, and think that um, a, a touch or a taste towards the end of this year will really spark their appetite to come back into next year. Um, but really support and encourage that participation. Again, show care for people if they're not quite comfortable then well, definitely participation should be at an individual's discretion. If they're not ready to come back into the netball fold, then don't force that. Um, but really be mindful about where people are at. Uh, same as our volunteers. Um, from looking at it, most of our volunteers are itching uh, like junior netballers to get back into the fold. Um, so uh, we want to encourage that, but just show care. Um, stay up to date and we'll provide as much up-to-date information as quickly as we can uh, straight to um, associations and clubs. Um, 
in particular around the roadmap to, to reopening, but anything else that might, that we think think might be relevant. Um, and plan and engage. Um, consult with your with your members. Consult with your clubs. Consult with your teams um, and see what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Um, one of the associations that got back earlier were doing a weekly touch point or a weekly check in with their uh, clubs just to see how things were tracking. Uh, COVID safety environments were quite new, so how was every everyone going? Uh, were they feeling comfortable? Were they feeling confident to keep going? You probably don't need to do that every week, but um, it's a really good thing just to, to reach out. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be formal either, just a quick chat on the phone or a message uh, to someone to ask them for their feedback can be really valuable. Um, but ultimately, you know, uh, uh, whatever's best for your association. I, and there might be some opportunities for collaboration too. AB mentioned earlier that we're, we're competitors on court but collaborators off court. So can you partner with a neighbouring association and, uh, and do some creative stuff? Um, just jumping back into the questions now, Mel, and just encourage anyone who's still got a question to pop it into the chat now before we wind up. Um, but yes, everyone who's pledged their membership remains a member of Netball Victoria, and we're very grateful to those people. Um, question about playing back-to-back -back games um, and umpires officiating or playing, uh, you know, officiating one game and playing or officiating two games, Mel? Yes, good question. Um, for in the guidelines, and um, we've provided quite a lot of information or, or detail tonight, there's probably another level or some more clarification in the guidelines. So please um, make sure you read through those. Uh, for adults, so at the minute in reality, we have adults competition, uh, no competition, uh, non-contact training only. We're suggesting there's no crossover between groups. Um, if you can't if you can't go with move within 1.5 metres um, while you're actually participating, then it makes no sense that we're exposing ourselves to multiple groups of people. Um, for competition and umpires, um, you know, umpires can maintain that 1.5 metre physical distance for the most part. So they can definitely umpire multiple games. Um, they don't have to stay on the same court or anything, but just make sure there's uh, again, that common sense approach to making sure that they're not sharing any of their own equipment, um, that they're bringing everything themselves, they're not carting around uh, bags and, and, and stuff like that, uh, and that they, you know, sanitise and wash their hands between each game and then move on to the next court. Um, so umpires can definitely uh, move between courts and move uh, umpire on multiple games. Uh, players, likewise, can, can play in multiple teams. Uh, we're suggesting that they probably don't uh, or that the competition structure will allow them enough time in between to go and wash their hands or sanitise or, or change um, if they have to change uniform. Uh, but, but that's allowed as well. Just on that point, if we've got one person playing five games, is that eliminating an opportunity for four other people to play? Uh, so... Um, is it required? Is it necessary? Um, is probably the two key questions. Um, and then, uh, but the, the, you know, playing on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night, that's totally fine. Mel, can I just ask you to flick back in the presentation to the page with the dates on it? And we'll just clarify the dates for everyone um, before we finish up. But also just had a question that um, Metro Football League is not sanctioning football training and for seniors until next year. Um, Certainly, we'll, we'll provide the advice about training um, in Metro or, or senior participation. We'll continue to provide that along with the government advice. So it's not our intent to delay that until February next year. But if there is um, senior participation keen to happen, that we would support it once the guidelines allow it to happen. Um, so we'll keep that updating that on our channels and communicating that with you as that information comes to hand. But just um, the other question here, Mel, which is why I've asked you to put the, that up, was just a clarification about the proposed dates again. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll just touch on the AFL or the footy netball league stuff. We, we are talking with AFL and have a similar mindset, really. Uh, you know, there's a, um, a move for clubs to start training or, or pre-season training in November October, um, which is just, you know, the Vixens don't start training until January next year and they're playing professional level sport. 
Um, so uh, what's, what's the purpose for it, I think, is, is the question. Is it about just getting the team together socially, which what are the other alternatives? What are the, the fitness level stuff that you can do and really how much fitness is valuable in November to play again in April? Um, and, but, but support um, people and that social connection because I think that's what we've, we've really missed and what we've been crying out for. So whilst there's, there might be a green light to start training um, for clubs to really think about the necessity for that uh, the purpose for that um, and the alternatives for people to connect. So I've just got that roadmap um, back up there and it's all with a great big asterisk of subject to change, but this is what we we're aiming for in that regional have the 18 and under contact and contact sport and the adult non-contact sport um, is underway now. Um, Metro waiting for that same um, privilege after on or after the 26th of October at this stage and 23 November being our indoor, indoor and adult statewide um, resumption. So whilst um, a lot of the com content today has really been delivered around regional returning, it's a really good opportunity for everyone in Metro to take that information um, to aid their planning, uh, which we, we understand that's why a lot of you are on today to, to get that information and to try and help you plan um, in this scenario. So I think that that's the last of our questions. So unless anyone's got a quick one that they're going to throw into the chat, um, I'll just take the opportunity again to thank you for your dedication in being here um, and continuing to engage and be involved and represent your members and, and try and get that ball happening in, in the, your areas. Um, can't wait to see some pictures coming through again of people getting back on courts because um, both as a, as a netball administrator but also as a parent and a netball and myself um, absolutely take a lot of joy from seeing other people um, get back to it and fingers crossed um, we'll also see the same for our metro counterparts very shortly. Um, one last question here I'm not sure if I fully understand but you will probably understand this better. Mal, re are regional trials still going ahead in October? Oh, would that be around the high performance pathway? Uh, yeah. So um, because we didn't have a social chance or any competition this year, really, um, the open selection trials for Victoria's state team and talent academy um, were tweaked or the process for identifying athletes for next year's programs were tweaked. Um, our, our pathways team are looking at um, moving the proposed open selection trials for state into early next year. Uh, just waiting on some, some information from Netball Australia uh, in terms of the timeline for, for the national champs um, and that competition to roll out. So it, expecting it to, um, those open selection trials to be moved from the proposed October dates uh, into the early part of next year. Uh, that's likely to align up with um, the open selection process for Talent Academy as well. Okay, yep. All right, so that, that is the last of the questions. So thank you very much for everyone for being online today.